Avenue. How are we doing this morning? All right, y'all got to do better than that. Y'all got to do better. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. So good to see you. If you're watching online and you're still spring breaking, we, we wish we were with you, but glad you're joining us online. Hey, listen, if you're a guest, we are so happy that you joined us. We know that you could be anywhere today. You could be anywhere, but you're with us, and we're so glad that you are joining us today. My name is Chad. I'm one of the student, minister, student ministers here at the Avenue. I work on an incredible student ministry team. Tracy Alverson is absolute, absolutely one of the hardest um, working student ministers that I've been around. Leighton Myers over in Ennis is killing it as they build up a student ministry there in Ennis. But let me tell you, I work with the best students in all of Ellis County, hands down, the best students. I love looking out and seeing them out here today. God has just done a work in the life of our student ministry this past year. Um, man, where do I start? We, we've got more students plugged in on Wednesday nights, our midweek experience than we've ever had, close to 350 students on Wednesday nights. Of those 350 students, 200 of them have said yes to their next step and, and said, hey, we want to we wanna continue small groups. We want to be plugged into a small group because we want to go a little bit deeper. Uh, we, they, they realize that, that life is not supposed to be done alone and it's better together, right? Hey, it's, it's been a, a good year and I'm excited to see where God continues to move. Um, last week, my dad got to share with you guys a little bit. Now, some of you are like, hold up. Alan is your dad? Couple things. He is my dad. Yes, he is my dad. I'm not adopted, okay? I was born with bigger bones than him, all right? In fact, there, hey, listen, there was a trend going around not long ago where you take a picture, a family picture from like 30 years ago when you were little, and you recreate it as an adult. And, and we were going to do that, but I couldn't find one of me on his shoulders because I thought it would be awesome to recreate that picture. <laughs> Didn't happen. But listen, he talked a little bit about the prodigal son, right? And, and I don't know about you guys, but I can relate to this son. Like, I think back of times in my life where I pursued all this other stuff that I thought, maybe this will make me happy. Maybe this will give me some peace. Maybe this over here will give me comfort. And what ended up happening is I look back and I go, man, I'm, I'm further from God than I've, I was when I first started this journey of trying to find happiness. In fact, I, I found myself in a hole, much like the prodigal son. He was, he was eating with the pigs. But I thank God for moments in my life where just like the prodigal son, I, I hit pause and go, man, I, I've come to my senses. Have you had that moment in your life where you've, you've come to your senses? Because then when I look back, I go, all this other garbage is nothing compared to Jesus. Nothing. He is so much greater than all of this. In fact, his name is above every other name. You see, the last couple weeks as I reflected on just different names that have impacted society, we came out of uh, Black History Month, and a man that I look up to is Martin Luther King, a guy who stood up for a cause in a very dark time of our country, gave one of the greatest speeches of all, and ultimately paid the price for this cause, right? Think of a guy named Mark Zuckerberg, you're going to laugh. You'd be like, is that really a positive or negative thing? You could take it, whatever. But we, we can all agree that it's, it, it has impacted the way we connect and the way we communicate with each other, right? Like right now, some of you want to check your phone to see if you have any Facebook notifications. It's that real, right? The next one, it's kind of funny. Truett Cathy, Chick-fil-A, Christian Chicken. Maybe it's just me, but he's made it. The dude is selling chicken, and they're not even open on Sundays. Incredible, right? But I think he's made more of an impact in me, not just because I like chicken. But listen, that was the first place I took my wife on our first date, all right? I needed a miracle and so, listen, she's way out of my league. She's way out of my league. I think she needs to get her eyes checked, but don't tell her that because I don't want to be exposed. Um, but listen, I needed a miracle. Took her to get, get some Christian chicken. It paid off. We're almost 11 years married. Got four kids. We're doing good, all right? Single people, take some notes, all right? Christian chicken. Seriously, though, these guys have made an impact in our society. But above all those names is Jesus. In 300 years... You might read about some of these guys in a textbook, but Jesus is still going to be setting people free. He's going to be giving hope, and he's still going to be moving in lives. This morning, I believe that there are three groups of people in this room. Three groups. Like right now, that first group, this whole Jesus talk makes you feel really uncomfortable. You don't like it. It's awkward. I get it. Like, you're, you're the husband that's in the crowd that your wife, and you and your wife aren't getting along right now. Things are bad. 
And she said, we're going to church. And he said, yes, ma'am. All right. There's some in here that maybe this morning your, your friends picked you up and said, we're going to Walmart. You ended up here at church. Like, hey, listen, we got great greeters out front, right? But if we're not Walmart, I'm glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here because I believe that I believe that the guy that is sustaining your beating heart right now desires a relationship with you. He's crazy about you. Even if you don't even want to be here, you realize he wants a relationship more with you than you do with him. And he's got something for you today. See, I believe with all my heart that Jesus died on the cross. And that's, just, that's not just getting it from the Bible. We're talking historical documents that prove he did what he did. But he didn't stay there. Three days later, he was alive. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to choose to follow someone who can pull that off, right? I'm going to give my life to that guy. I think there's a second group of people in the room that you kind of relate to this prodigal son. Like you made some choices, and maybe you're frustrated, you're angry, you feel like there's no hope, you're ready to quit. Don't quit. He hasn't quit on you. There's a third group in here. You would say, man, your relationship with the Lord is pretty good right now. Don't get comfortable. I believe without a doubt that Jesus wants to move in your life, whether you're a believer or not, he wants to do something. And I think when you allow him to change your life, there's some benefits, right? Things that he's gonna do. We're not alone. And because we're not alone, there's things he wants to do in our life. I think he wants to provide help. I believe he wants to, he wants to provide healing. He wants to give us hope. That's going to kind of be where we head today. Before we get there, we're going to look at the life of a guy named Saul. If you know the story very well, he changes his name to Paul. But before we get there, I want to back up to Acts chapter 6 for just a little bit to kind of give you some background on what's going on. In Acts chapter 6, the early church is experiencing some drama. Surprise, right? Like if you've been around church, you know church and drama go hand in hand. It just is. It's, it's part of it. And there was a lot of drama, and and this early church really needed some leaders to step up and lead, and that's where we see Stephen step up, right? Stephen was one of the the very first deacons that we see in that early church, and and God is using him to do incredible things. He's taking this message, and people are listening, except for these religious leaders back then. They didn't didn't want anything to do with this message. They hated it. There was some tension. In fact, this tension grew in Acts chapter 7. We see it. It's It's pretty tight right now. Like, it is not good. And, and, and Stephen's delivering this message. He's looking at the crowd. He's teaching. These religious leaders are there, there listening to everything he has to say. And in his message, he looks at these religious leaders, and I believe he calls them stiff-necked. And if that doesn't tick them off, the next thing that he does is he says that he looks up, and it says, he says, I see Jesus. And, and check out what happens in Acts chapter 7, verses 57 and 58. It says, at this time... They covered their, covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. I don't know about you guys. If you've got kids, you know, you know what's happening right here. Like you're trying to tell them something, and they cover their ears, and they start screaming. They don't want to hear it. They're acting like children here. These religious leaders are, are going nuts. It says they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. <laughs> Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. Guys, I was just talking to someone that was at one of the very first messages that I ever preached. Um, I actually have a CD that I've never listened to because it was probably that bad. And, uh, and I was thinking, I've, I've preached some really bad sermons, but I have yet to be stoned for it. Like, seriously, I've not been stoned. Now, there is still time today for that to happen. Hopefully, we're not going there because I love you guys, all right? But something crazy happens that day. Like, there's this idea that, that Saul was responsible for Stephen's death. We don't know that for sure. But what we do know is something drastically happened in Saul's life that day. He snaps. Have you ever been around someone who snapped? Parents, take your kid's phone away from them. They'll snap. Something crazy happens in Saul's life that day, and it sparks something in him. The next chapter, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, it says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. Stephen was the very first martyr. Continues in verse 3. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. Remember that right there. Remember that phrase, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. 
I think we can all assume that he went, he went and put him in prison with the hopes of doing the same thing he did to Stephen, right? He wanted to see him dead. But think about this whole idea of him going house to house, dragging people out and putting them in prison. That didn't happen in Texas, right? Like, we got guns. We got security cameras. You've watched Walking Dead, and you're ready for the zombie apocalypse. It's, no one's coming into our house and taking anything from us. Listen, you don't have to be a Christian today to realize that something's gone on in Saul's life. He's lost his mind. It continues in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked for the letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there that belonged to the way, the way are those who follow Jesus, whether men or women, that he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. You got to know this. Damascus was, uh, gosh, about 160 miles away from Jerusalem, an uh, uh, eight or nine day journey on foot. And what I can gather from this is that, that Saul, he didn't just want to kill in Jerusalem, right? He wanted to take his evil and spread it everywhere. And I, I look at Saul here, and I think, man, this guy has lost his mind. Like, there's no hope. There's no hope for this guy. Last week, we talked about the prodigal son, and I, I reflect on the dad in this story. And imagine with me, I know it's a story that has a great, great picture for us, but imagine if this story played out like this. The dad sends out a friend to go look for his son, goes to the big city. This friend sees the son, he's strung out. You can see the bad decisions, it's all over his face. In fact, he might have ran into him at, a pig, at the pig stall. Like, the guy's not good. And I can imagine the, the friend going back home, and he says, Dad, you, need to, you just need to move on. Like, I saw, I saw a little Bobby out there. He's strung out. He doesn't look good. There's no hope for him. Think about that in your life. Who are the people in your life that you go, there's no hope for them? Is it a spouse that's made some decisions that have hurt you? That you're just ready to quit. There's no hope. Maybe your kids. Who is it in your life where you go, you know what? I'm about to just quit and give up on them. I need you to see what happens next. It says, as he neared Damascus, as Saul heads to Damascus on his journey, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and, and heard a voice say to him, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. This moment, at this moment, his life was completely changed, right? To the point where he changes his name. He doesn't even want to be associated with who he once was. His life was changed, In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, it gives us a, a pretty cool picture of how much his life had changed and what Jesus had did, done in his life. Listen to this. this is Acts 20, verse 20. This is Paul now talking. He says, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly, listen to this, and from house to house. That sounds familiar? See, in, in, in chapter 8 of Acts, what was he doing? He was going house to house, persecuting people for this message that was being taught. Now he's taking that same message because he's been changed by Jesus, and he's bringing people to Jesus. Guys, only Jesus can do that, right? Only Jesus can do something like that. And I'm telling you right now, he wants to do that same thing in the people in your life that you've given up hope on. And I believe he can. Today, I need you to, I need you to see you're not alone. You're not alone, and I think there's some things that Jesus wants to do because you're not alone. The first is this. He wants to bring you healing. He wants to bring you healing. I'm a, I don't know if it's because I'm a dude. I don't, maybe all the guys do this, but I don't, I don't like to admit when I'm sick. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I can suck it up. You'll be okay. Last, uh, last year during our Super Bowl, I felt pretty crummy all day. I love football. didn't want to miss the Super Bowl, so went over to some friend's house, our life group's house for for this Super Bowl party, and I remember sitting there going, man, I don't feel good. Like, and maybe you've, you've experienced this where you can feel like fever coming up your back. 
and it's like creeping up your back and it gets up to your neck and your ears. Well, I remember thinking, I've got fever. Like I'm a pretty slow guy. Like, and I knew that I, <laughs> I probably had fever, but it, it took a little bit, okay? And, and I remember thinking, no, I, yeah, I've got fever. And there were lots of little kids running around and I remember standing up and just backing out of the house going, I gotta get out of here. I don't wanna get anybody sick. But even then, I got home, I was running like 104 temp, and I kept telling myself, that's not that bad. I'm okay. Ended up having the flu. But I remember telling myself, it's okay, it's not that bad. Isn't that what we do with hurt in our life? We tell ourselves, it's really not that bad. We tell everybody around us, it's okay, I'm okay. But deep down, you know what? It's not okay. And maybe this hurt was brought on to you by something that maybe you did on yourself or maybe it was something that was brought on to you by other people, but you know you need healing today. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest with you. You can go to all the self-help books that you can find. You can ask Siri, but you're only gonna find healing in Jesus, guys. Only gonna find it in him. Today, you might be holding on to your past. I haven't pursued a relationship with Jesus because, and if he knew what I did, he wouldn't want anything to do with me. Like, I've made some pretty poor choices, Chad. There's no way he would want anything to do with me. You hold on to that past. You think, you think that Paul ever did that? The guy was a murderer. He was a murderer. Do you think he ever struggled with his past? Absolutely. Romans 7, 24 says, what a wretch man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Philippians 3, 13, I love this. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. So he knew that healing was only gonna be found in Jesus that past he could let go of. In fact, Romans 8, 1, he writes, therefore there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. He's using some court, courtroom language right here. That whole no condemnation means, hey, man, you've been found not guilty. You're innocent. The past is done. You're freed up. You don't have to hold on to it anymore. Today, listen, if you're holding on to the past and you are a believer, you don't have to. It's been, you've, been, you've been found innocent. You can let go of it. Today, if your reasoning for not pursuing a relationship with Jesus is because of your past, it's through him that you can find freedom. Only him. Healing is found in Jesus. The second thing is Jesus wants to bring you help. He wants to bring you help. I know about you guys, but that sounds pretty good. There was a time in my life where I knew everything there was to know about raising kids. You know when that was? Yeah, before I had kids, right? How many of y'all know people in your life that's that way? Like they look at your kids and your kids are throwing a fit and they're like, man, I would never let my kid do that. And you want to smack them, like throat punch them. <laughs> and now they have kids and you just laugh. Like I, I remember praying, I wish you had five kids. <laughs> and I hope they're terrors because I'm just going to laugh at you. Maybe that's what you thought about marriage, right? Before you got married, you knew everything. I knew everything there was about being a husband. And then you get in there and it's not what you expected. Like, ladies, you're like, wait a second. I thought he was supposed to take the trash out. Men are like, well, she's supposed to cook me a, a nice hot meal every day when I come in from work. She's not supposed to be tired. It, did, it doesn't happen that way, right? It isn't what we thought. And some of you today are like, man, yeah, now my marriage is falling apart. It's hard. It's hard. Maybe you're like, my kids have made some choices. And it hurts to see them go down this path and I'm ready to just quit, I get it. Maybe there's an area in your life where you feel like, man, it's got a control over you like nothing else, addiction or habit. Maybe you're just a jerk and no one wants to be around you. Have you asked him for help? Man, as a dad, I absolutely love it when my kids come to me and say, daddy, can you help me? Can you fix this? And then I get to fix it. Hopefully it's not a big deal because I'm in trouble. Then daddy has to ask for help. 
But no, they come to me and I want to fix their issues, right? I want to fix the toy. I want to fix this because I love when they run off and go, Daddy, he fixed it. He helped me. I believe when we go to to God, it's the most honoring thing we can to go, hey, I can't do this. I need you. Help me. Help me fix it. You can, and I can't. Asking for help, it's not a sign of failure. It's not a sign of failure. Maybe today you need to ask other people to walk into your life and help you out. Other Christians. And we've got an incredible uh, ministry here at our church called Celebrate Recovery. You're not alone. People want to walk with you. In fact, there's this idea, guys, that you have to have your stuff together before you can come to church. And if you've been around the avenue long enough, you know that, that, that David preaches, we want to be a hospital for the hurting, right? We want to be a place where people can run to and not run away from. And if you've got issues, you're not alone, and we've got people that want to walk with you. Maybe today you're the parent that's ready to quit. And we got an awesome family ministry team. And, and, and we're not just this glorified babysitting service for you on Wednesday nights or Sundays. We love uh, watching your kids and hanging out with your kids because for us, it's an opportunity to show them Jesus. But we also have resources for you parents. In the, in the hub, we've got resources that tell you about each phase that your kid's gonna go through. But we wanna walk with you too, parents. You're not alone. Maybe today you just need a tribe of people that are going to walk with you. Other couples that are in the same spot you are, or maybe families that are in the same place you are in life, that you just need a tribe. You need a life group. And I love my life group. Like, when things are going good in my life, I can expect a phone call. I can expect a celebration, a party, because they celebrate life with this. But the opposite is true too, right? When life stinks and I'm ready to quit, they're there and they're crying with us. They're doing life with us. Life is not supposed to be meant to be done alone. Today, as tough as it is, get help. Ask someone for help. Guys, today your circumstances may not change, but I believe your perspective can change because of Jesus. Listen, if he, if he did this miracle work in the life of Saul, I believe he can do it in yours. The third thing that Jesus wants to do today is that he wants to bring you hope. He wants to bring you hope. If you know me very well, you know I'm a Texas Longhorn fan. Hook them horns, all right? Haters gonna hate. Go ahead. (laughs) One of my favorite football games of all times, which I believe is the best, was the 2006 Rose Bowl game against USC. Anybody remember that game? All I need to say is Vince Young, all right? Um, This game was huge. There were a lot of big names in this game. Uh, Matt Leinart, I don't know where he's at. Uh, Reggie Bush. Vince Young, I know he was just in the news. It's okay, we'll pray for him. Um, but it was an incredible game. Texas wasn't supposed to win. In fact, I believe USC was going for their third uh, national championship. And, and at one point in the game, it was Texas was down 12, I believe. And I'll be honest with you, I'm a huge fan, but I'm like, all USC has to do here is run the clock out and they win. We're done. Texas battles their way back through. They, they have a couple of key fourth down stops. They're back in the game. In fact, it's uh, 26 seconds left in the game. It's fourth and five. This fourth and five, I'm going, there's no hope. We're done. We're done. That's the kind of fan I am, I guess. Well, we're, we're, there, is, there is no hope here. There's no hope here. We're done. 26 seconds left. Vince Young takes the snap, rolls around, and runs into the corner of the end zone. Texas ends up winning the game. Let me ask you today, what's your fourth and five? What's your fourth and five? What's the area in your life where you're just giving up hope? This is how it's gonna be. Nothing's gonna change. This is it, it's over. You know, I've seen so many times people will try to find hope in different things. Like we've got the relationship hoppers that, that, up. I can't find hope in this relationship, so I'll go to this relationship over here, and then it's this relationship. Maybe I'll find hope here. Maybe for you, you've pursued maybe drinking pills, and I tell you, hope's not found there. In fact, today, you might be ready to give up, but can I tell you, there's never been a time where Jesus has ever let you down. Why? 
I look to an empty tomb. I look to an empty tomb. See, they put him in there thinking he was dead. But three days later, he's alive and he's fully capable of your fourth and five, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Today, we're all about taking next steps. We're all about responding. We all have a response to Jesus today. This week I was reflecting on just the different responses people gave Jesus in scripture. There was a time where a father comes up to Jesus and said, hey, my daughter is dead. He walks in and goes, no, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. You know what they did? They laughed at him. There are times where he delivered demons out of people and they said, oh, he's of the devil. That's why he can do that. They mocked him. So they all have responses. What's your response today? If today you know you need to follow him and you start that relationship with Jesus today, what's keeping you from doing that? Hey, guys, we're talking about eternity here. Why in the world would you put that off? Maybe today you need to buck up and just ask for help. It's not a sign of failure, but it's a sign of going, I can't stay where I'm at. I need somebody to walk with me. Today, here in a little bit, we're gonna be done with the service and you got, a, you got an opportunity. You can either respond to this message or you can respond by going, I'm gonna go my different way. But you, you will have a response, right? Your response could be you just move on and you just ignore it or you can make it happen today. Don't quit on yourself. Ask for help. Make that decision today. Let's pray. Now we love you. And we're blown away that you choose to have a relationship with us. You're a God that's present and active in our life. We're not alone because you're with us. God, I pray for that person in the room, that spouse in the room that knows that they've messed up, that today that they would take their step and ask for help to save their marriage. I pray for the person here that knows that they need a relationship with you and, and they've been holding on to their past. God, I pray that they would be freed from that today because of your son, that they need to respond. God, give them the courage to do that. We love you and we pray this in your son's name. Amen.